Good evening. Welcome to our program called A History of Our Place. Let me begin by telling you what this program is not. It's not a history of the 100 years from the formation of the city of Attleboro to today. Many of you have lived a good part of that time span in Attleboro, and you know that history firsthand. I'm sure that over the centennial year, the 100-year history of the city will be recounted. So what we are going to do now is take a look at the greater and longer history of our place that led to the formation of our city. It begins 10,000 years ago. All places on earth have a history that go back to the creation of the earth. This is true of our area we now call Attleboro, our town, our particular part of it. The site of our house, our apartment, our park, has a history that extends back to the formation of the earth. We'll begin by looking at the past, at the time when human beings first appeared in our part of the planet. During the Ice Age, 60,000 years ago to 14,000 years ago, the land extended out past what today is Nantucket Island. The sea level was much lower, 400 feet lower. Why? Because all of that water was locked up in the glaciers. During the last Ice Age, New England was covered by an ice blanket up to 6,000 feet thick. A mile of ice where we now live. By 14,000 years ago, there's a picture of, our, of Attleboro. 14,000, 14, uh, yeah. do you recognize your house? Uh, by 14,000 years ago, the ice was retreating into Canada, and the land in New England is uncovered. Now, let me get out my little clicker here. Hope it works. There's Attleboro, 13,000 years ago. Okay, the land when it's uncovered is not forest like it is now, or like it was when the pilgrims arrived. What it is is more like uh, Arctic tundra. There are few, if any, trees. There are large animals called megafauna that move into this area. Mastodons walked, perhaps, in your backyard. There were animals like the musk ox, who were six feet tall at the shoulders. Again, the megafauna. And, in fact, in recent years, trawlers have dragged up the teeth and tusks of mastodons and mammoths from the bottom of the Georges Bank fishing area, which at that time was above sea level. Sometime between 13,000 and 10,000 years ago, groups of early people called the Paleo Indians arrived here. They are the ancestors of the Native Americans of today. These small nomadic van, man, uh, excuse me, bands followed and hunted the large megafauna that lived in this area at the end of the Ice Age. Animals such as mammoths and cave bears are their prey. Does anybody recognize the weapon he's hunting the mastodon with? This is called, this is a uh, again, a paleo weapon from 10,000 years ago. It's called an atlatl. That's what we call it today. I'm not sure what they called it. But it's a, it's a weapon that increased the force with which you could throw a dart at these large animals. You had to have something uh, to cause your weapon to, to penetrate these very, very large animals. And I brought my atlatl to show you. Don't you all have an atlatl at home? <laughs> this is what we're talking about. This weapon, again, used a dart, not a spear. A spear being a much heavier. It's a dart that had a fairly slender shaft, was fleshed with feathers, 
And this is the thrower. How it's used, fingers go in there like that. It goes back like this. There's a slight hollow in the back of this thing that goes on to a point on the end, like a bird's beak. You hold it like this. You pull it back. I'm not going to throw it, don't I? <laughs> but when you throw it, this comes up and over, and now it's like your arm is five feet long. It's a tremendous force multiplier. I've thrown this thing around a lot in the field. It is amazing how far you can throw a dart using an atlatl. So that is a paleo weapon used to kill very large game, as you can see here. Don't ask me why I have an atlatl. I just, <laughs> I got interested in them and, uh, and decided to make one, so I did. Uh, in fact, I can tell you a little story. My wife and I took a course at Wheaton College, uh, was it two years ago now? Uh, and it was on uh, the history of how, how uh, people moved across the Bering Straits and down through Canada when the, when my, when the ice melted and how they came into the United States. And uh, anyway, the professor was up there talking about it, and he said, well, those paleo Indians use something called an atlatl. He said, I'm sure none of you have ever heard of an atlatl. And, and I raised my hand, and I said, I have one. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you have an atlatl? <laughs> and I did, so I brought it in. Anyway, that's the kind of people that were the first people in this area. Uh, again, you've got a picture, Arctic tundra, huge animals roaming around. And these small bands uh, pursuing the animals. Uh, where was I? Okay. Now, there are a few paleo sites found in Massachusetts, but some, there are some. That's because hunters only stayed a few days in one place, as the animals were constantly on the move. Uh, at the Wamsutta site in Canton, Massachusetts, along the Neponset River, Many, many paleo tools have been found, as well as caribou bones and fragments of mastodon tusks. These large animals were killed by using spears and atlatls or spear throwers. By 9,000 years ago, our area entered the Archaic period. Climate changed from cool and dry to warmer and moister, and the tundra changed to spruce and oak forests. So finally, our area starts to get trees. The megafauna had disappeared. They're not exactly sure why the megafauna disappeared. It may be because their, their tundra habitat disappeared and they weren't able to adapt. Uh, they, some people think maybe they were overhunted and killed off. Uh, that we simply don't know. But those extremely large animals disappeared. And smaller animals like deer, caribou, turkey, squirrels, and rabbits are plentiful, as are the fish. And edible plants and nuts are also utilized for food by the Native Americans at the time. This increase in food supply supports an increase in human population, who are still nomadic but can travel in larger groups over smaller territories. This era lasts for around 6,000 years. So this is a settlement of that era. The Woodland Indian period lasts from 3,000 years ago to the 1600s, when the, when the pilgrims arrive. During this time, Native Americans develop tribal living with relatively large groups living in communities that are far less nomadic than previously. The institution of agriculture allows for large and fixed communities with cultural and organizational development. So now you're going to large Native American communities. The main crops are corn, beans, and squash. Farming tools, canoes, bows and arrows, pottery, and birch bark containers are some of the develop developments during the Native, this Native American era. In the 1600s, everything is about to change. The 10,000 plus year control of this land is about to come to a tragic end. Again, the Native Americans have a 10,000-year-old cultural history about to end. European traders discover the North American continent and introduce European diseases that the Native Americans have no immunity against. 
Deadly epidemics decimate the Indian populations. Before the coming of the Europeans, the local Wampanoag tribe numbered somewhere between 30,000 and 16,000. By the time the pilgrims land in 1620, disease has reduced their number to around 5,000. Similar or worse epidemics affect the other tribes of New England. When the settlers we call the pilgrims come to what is today Plymouth, Massachusetts, they encounter the Wampanoag tribe and its leader, Massasoit. The name Massasoit, by the way, was, not, was a title. It was not an individual's name. It was uh, something to the equivalent of great leader. At that time, our area was part of the ancestral lands of the Wampanoags. Many Indian artifacts have been found along the banks of the Ten Mile River. Twenty-three years after the landing of the Pilgrims, a Reverend Samuel Newman and his flock left Weymouth and established the town of Rehoboth on the Patuxent River. Now at this point, I'm going to break in what I have been explaining, and Barbara Hansen is going to come up and pick it up, uh, and she will explain the perspective from which she is coming. Thank you. And this is the clicker, yes? Just yes. Oh, you want me to do them? Or do yes, you, you can do Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm Barbara, and um, as Betty had indicated, when we were teachers in the city of Attleboro, all third or fourth grade classes were exposed to the, the history of Attleboro as part of their curriculum. And uh, for us, we, it usually came at the end of the uh, school year. Now, the important part of working with young children is making connections so that they can take the knowledge that they have and then add the new knowledge to it. And so, um, in order to do that, we used to work off the base of the pilgrims in 1620. In the fall, we, it, when the years were good and we had the money, we could take field trips down to Plymouth so the children could actually see how these uh, early settlers lived. And um, then, throughout the year, we went on to teach about Jamestown and the other 13 colonies and um, constantly making those connections. Our resources were pretty slim, but we relied on making timelines, and I kind of made a, a rough sketch or here, a prototype of a timeline. And um, our Bible was, in the beginning, this, which is Daggett's History of Attleboro. It's a great reading material for the beach. Whoops, I'm so rude. <laughs> and um, the more uh, the, uh, condensed version of the history of Attleboro, and of course, Studley's history of Attleboro, where a lot of our facts came. There was also um, this uh, small pamphlet that was created by Mildred Tingley, and it also was a useful tool, to, especially for teachers who, weren't, uh, who didn't grow up in this area and weren't familiar with a lot of the things that uh, we had to cover. So a good place to start would be to introduce the seal of Attleboro. And in looking at a seal of Attleboro, asking important questions to the kids like, what kinds of things do you notice on that? And they'd say, oh, well, there's a chain, and there's a funny looking lion, and there's some funny looking letters. And seals are symbol, have symbols on them. And so um, as we co continue to talk tonight, we're going to be talking about some of these symbols and why they are on the seal of Attleboro, which, by the way, is on all of the police cars and fire trucks and the pennants that line Union Street and in the newspaper. The on seal the new white ornaments. on the new, as Betty says, on the new white ornament. So then I would um, ask them if they've ever heard of. Blackstone Valley or Blackstone River, and how many of you have been to the Blackstone River and done the bike trail or been over to Ann and Hope, and that's, that's really part of the Blackstone Valley? Well, the reason they're called Blackstone Valley is obviously because of William Blackstone. And as a young man in 1623, that's, by the way, the Woodcock Garrison, so we're a little ahead of our time, I think. Um, but um, in 1623, William Blackstone came over from England on a ship and decided he liked it here, so he stayed and the ship went back. And he settled 
in what is now called the Boston Common. And um, he was very happy. He was a very solitary man and didn't really want a lot of people around him. But new settlers appeared on the horizon, the Puritans. And he decided that he would be um, the welcoming sort. And there, where they were settling, the drinking water was not very good. It was brackish. And so he invited them to share his fresh water from the spring um, near where his settlement was. And the honeymoon period didn't last very long. The Puritans became very, very um, unhospitable. And actually, at one point, they asked him to leave. And this doesn't seem too fair to kids. So uh, he did. And he said, I'm just going to um, find myself another better place to live. And so he packed up all his belongings, which consisted primarily of books. He loved books. And um, his apple seeds, which he brought with him from England. And a small herd of cattle. I won't even say herd. A couple of cows and his cream-colored bull, which he rode. And he traveled the 35 miles from Boston and found, him, um, found himself finally at this beautiful, beautiful river. And he said, this is where I'm going to stay. And so um, he built a house called, uh, called it Study Hall, or Study Hill. I've seen it both ways. And um, he lived very contentedly making trips on that same cream-colored bull to visit um, Roger Williams, his good friend. Blackstone was an Anglican minister who came over from England to, um, because he, he didn't like the ostentatious way that the English a Anglicans celebrated their mass. And so he decided in coming here, he would simplify things a little bit. And he and Roger Williams would sometimes trade off and preach in each other's chapels. Um, he was someone that the Indians trusted. And the sad ending to his story is that um, during something that we're going to talk about in a minute, King Philip's War, his home was burned to the ground. At that time, he had 184 books in his collection. And um, fortunately, he had died, I think it was two years before his ha house was burned by um, the Indians. So we owe a lot to William Blackstone, even though he was, um, as I say, a character and a solitary individual. At this point in the curriculum, we would usually introduce a, a map of early Attleboro. And it's hard for kids to realize that early Attleboro was huge. And it, it, contained, um, it contained what we now call parts of Rhode Island, like East Providence and uh, Pawtucket. And it included Rehoboth and Seekonk and other areas around. And so one of the activities that we would often do with the kids is we would um, show a, a current map and have them do some comparing and contrasting of the area. It was at this point in teaching the curriculum that um, I would introduce some of the important Native Americans who really made or had a tremendous impact on our history, starting, as George had mentioned, with Massasoit. Massasoit was the sachem of the Wampanoag Federation, and he is remembered for welcoming the newcomers to this land. His son, one of his sons, was named Wamsada, and he was, Wamsada was referred to as Alexander by the English. They felt that if it was um, a compliment to the Native Americans to be given an English name. So they, they never used his, his uh, Indian name of Wamsada. And uh, for a short time, Wamsada ruled as the sachem of the Pakanaka tribe. And it's his signature that is on the Great Seal of Attleboro. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, another son named Pametacom, sometimes referred to as Metacomet, was called King Philip by the uh, settlers. And he became infamous during that time period that we know as King Philip's War, which uh, was from 1675 to 1676. Um, and that's, that's a tragic story unto itself. Now, the next part of this presentation is called Let's Make a Deal. How many of you have been by Willett School? 
That was where I used to teach for many, many years, right near the end. And um, that is, uh, Willett School is named after Captain Thomas Willett, and he was one of the coolest characters. And that's a point I want to make, that when you are teaching history to young children, you want to try to make the people and the events come alive. And this, some of the stories that go along with the history of Attleboro could be made into a movie by Hollywood producers. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff here. Um, and so Captain Thomas Willett, I think of as one of the coolest characters. And back in England, Willett had been a merchant, and he had even lived with the pilgrims for a while in Leyden, Holland. And so when he arrived here, he lived for a time with the pilgrims. He was a surveyor, and he helped to settle other parts of the colony. And the Indians, Native Americans, the Indians, um, began to consider him as their loving friend, Captain Willett. And so perhaps that's why a group of about 80 settlers chose Captain Willett to uh, negotiate a purchase of land. As George ref uh, mentioned, Reverend Samuel Newman had already purchased land. And that first purchase was called the Rehoboth Purchase. This second land deal was the Rehoboth North Purchase, and it extended over into uh, the area where William Blackstone lived, the Attleboro Gore. And um, we don't have any idea uh, what they were offering it as payment for this land. It's not like um, the island of Manhattan, we know that that was sold for, was it $24 in trinkets and seashells and things? Um, we don't really know what they gave the Indians in return for this land, um, but we know that uh, after Massasoit's death, when Wamsada was uh, the ruling sachem, he was willing to work with the settlers and to consummate this land deal. One of the things that I found um, it was important to try to teach kids was that the concept of land ownership was basically the European concept. Native Americans did not own land. Um, but one of the first things the settlers did was erect fences. And many times their fences cut right across walkways where the Indians had used for centuries. And, but once those fences went up, there was no trespassing. And so that was one of the very unfair things that happened because of land ownership. Um, one of the most cantankerous of our early settlers was John Woodcock, and this is the Woodcock Garrison House. And John Woodcock arrived in what we call North Attleboro in 1669 with his sons and their families and built a public house along the Old Bay Road, and um, we now know of it as Route 1 in North Attleboro. He fortified this building as a garrison, John Woodcock was shrewd and hardy and fearless and daring, and he hated Indians. He refused to recognize that Indians had any rights at all. He once kidnapped an Indian baby as payment for a debt. But his, his colleagues weren't too happy about that, and so he was sentenced to the stocks for one whole day. Um, and this was um, in the training fields at Rehoboth and he had to pay a fine of 40 shillings, and I'm sure that that did not make him very happy. In my readings about John Woodcock, it, um, he not only owned the 300 acres around where that house still stands, but he had another 600 acres altogether. He was, he was uh, quite an entrepreneur. His holdings uh, at that time included family homes for his sons and their wives, and a blacksmith shop. The Indians tried many times to kill John Woodcock, but they never succeeded. At his death, his body showed the wounds of seven bullets. In spite of that, he lived a very long life. We always took field trips to the Woodcock Garrison House and the one-room schoolhouse right next door, and the kids really liked spending time in the little secret, in uh, the closet. There was an Indian hiding place when, the, when they were threatened with an attack. Um, the, uh, the other part of John Woodcock is that 
right before or right at the beginning of King Philip's wars, um, the Indians had come upon John Woodcock's sons and son-in-laws, and they were working in a cornfield across the street. And so they planned an attack, and in this attack, they actually killed his son -in -law, one of his son-in-laws, one of his sons. And what they did, and the kids love this story, is they took, they took his head, Nathan's head, or I think it was Nathaniel, Nathaniel's head, and put it on a pole and stuck it right there in the cornfield. And to this day, that's still a burial place. It's um, over in that, where that terrible intersection is in North Attleboro, where Route 1 and 1A and all come together, and it's, uh, you'll see the cemetery is still there. And uh, so I think we can tell from that that there was no love lost between John Woodcock. And so um, part of the reason for King Philip's War was that Wamsada only um, served as sachem for, I think it was two years, George. And um, he had gone to visit uh, the pilgrims. They had actually called him, summoned him to, uh, to have a talk about something. And while he was there, one version of the story is that he came down with the flu and he passed away. The, uh, his brother, Philip, thought that he had been poisoned. And maybe he was, we have no idea. But there had been so many injustices by that time that, um, that they just decided that this was not going to work. And so they began attacking all of the, uh, the settlements and killing and burning. And I think that um, after reading about some of the injustices, I, I can't say that I blame them at all for all of that. Um, when Wamsada could no, uh, was no longer uh, alive, his brother, Metacom, King Philip, became the ruler. And he was the one who led the Native Americans on the attacks. And King Philip's war. To, to think that there was actually a war fought right where we are, right where we live, always gives me um, goosebumps. This was a wild frontier, and um, small settlements began, or really needed to unify because they wanted protection from attacks. And so they also wanted to attract more settlers to the area. And so eventually, they appealed to the general courts to make Attleboro a town. This guaranteed them both secular and religious education. The name Attleboro was probably proposed by John Daggett and his friend John Sutton. They had come from Attleboro, England, and Attleboro was in Norfolk County, England. And when you break it apart, it's at le burg, meaning at the town or at the castle. And the castle that I understand was the Bungay Castle. And so, um, that explains the origin of our name. Um, now, I think, uh, unless you have any questions, um, I will say that Captain Thomas Willett uh, went on to become the first mayor of the city of New York. That's how brilliant a man he was and how respected and how admired he was. So um, that takes us through the 1600s <laughs> to 1694 when Attleboro uh, became incorporated as a town. And that's O U G H. Okay. Interesting characters, interesting events. Okay, a couple of facts uh, that interest me in this, but that particular period before we move on. Uh, we talked about the North Purchase and that piece of land being bought. By, by the way, it was 80 square miles. It was purchased from the, uh, the Native Americans. And it was purchased, by, again, from Wamsutta. And he was a good friend of Thomas Willits. Now, interestingly to me, before Wamsutta was, was the leader, before he was Sachem, and Massasoit was still the leader. Now, interesting that a couple of years before he died, Massasoit was assaulted by two uh, uh, of the settlers. And, uh, they were actually uh, taken to trial for, for assaulting him. So he would probably not have sold land to the settlers had he been Sachem. Wamsutta becomes leader. He's only leader for one year. 
before he dies. He's the one who sold the North Purchase, where we live, to the settlers. And who follows him but King Philip, who declares war on everybody. So he is definitely not someone who would have sold it. So in that one year window, that's when the land was purchased and became the North Purchase where we live. The other, the other fact that, that always uh, interests me is that originally when the North Purchase was bought, it was part of Rehoboth. All of this land where we live was Rehoboth. And once people were living out here, uh, they are the ones who petitioned the state government or the, or the government of the time, the, the, the council, the royal council, uh, to start a town of their own. And why do you think they did that? Well, they're like everybody. They're like us. Uh, in those days, everybody had to go to church on Sunday. You know, if you don't go to church, you'd be kicked out of the community. So the people who lived here had to go to church in Rehoboth, 10 miles away. No roads, no cars, no horses, really. This is a 10-mile walk every Sunday. So when they petitioned, the first reason they gave why they wanted to start their own town, so they would not have to walk to Rehoboth on Sunday. And it's right in their, right in their petition. Uh, so that's kind of interesting to me, yeah. They had, and then they threw in some other things. Oh, you're going to get these benefits. We're going we're to cut timber for, for, for you to use for, for boats. And, and we're going to have uh, uh, soldiers. And, but the real reason, they didn't like to walk to Rehoboth. Uh, and that's how Adler actually got, got founded. That's King Philip there. An uh, interesting point about the war, we, I talked about how the, the diseases had decimated the, uh, the Wampanoags before the pilgrims came. And they had gone from possibly as many as 30,000, as few as 16,000, down to 5,000. Well, King Philip lost the war. After the war, 500 Wampanoags left. Again, we look back at that 10,000 year history of the Native Americans being here for 10,000 years. The Europeans show up, and in less than 50 years, they're, in this area, they're wiped out. They no longer really have any impact on the history because they simply aren't here. Uh, that's the tragic part of, uh, of our history, you know, something that uh, probably uh, we shouldn't be too, prou are, are too proud of as far as our, if, if your family came over in the Mayflower. <laughs> You know, maybe it's not such a good thing. Uh, by 1694, about 30 families lived on the North Purchase. Again, it was 80 square miles. Uh, the new township of Attleboro was named after Attleboro, England. And we talked about the road, North Attleboro being, uh, of course, there was no North Attleboro then, but that, that portion of Attleboro being located on the Bay Road, which, which went from Boston to Newport. And when you think that road, think of this. <laughs> yeah, not Route 95. Uh, it was probably rutted, ran through you know, woods, uh, and was not really a, uh, a big thoroughfare. Let me see if we have. There it is. That's the, by that, by the way, is the, the sign at the entrance of Attleboro, England. And I have somebody who's been here. Betty. 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 We have, you know, we have some turkeys of our own, uh, but Attleboro, England was famous for that. Uh, but in our town here, when it's originally formed, most of the inhabitants are farmers with a small number of tradesmen like blacksmith or innkeepers. In the following years, Attleboro grew and became more organized. Town meetings decided questions about taxes, schools, and municipal offices. In the early years of Attleboro, farmers were largely self-sufficient. But there were some industrial endeavors, such as a grist mill at Attleboro Falls. In 1701, there was an iron foundry at Mechanics Pond. Uh, 
That's kind of what an iron foundry in those days looked like. Uh, it was kind of a blast furnace that they would build, and uh, water power would be used to pump the bellows to blow the air up through the, uh, through the ore. The type of ore was called bog ore because it was found in, in boggy areas, and they found it around here. And so there was one of the first iron making endeavors in the United States was in Attleboro here at the end of Mechanics Pond. Uh, there was also uh, a grist mill and a sawmill at Mechanics Paul Falls. In May of 1776, with the, when the Revolutionary War loomed, a committee of Attleboro townsmen declared if the Continental Congress should think it best to declare for independence of Great Britain, we unanimously desire to engage to defend them. So uh, the people in Attleboro were in favor of, of uh, liberation from Great Britain. Many groups of militia left from Attleboro to fight for independence. The Revolutionary War created in the United States, of which Attleboro was a part. But another revolution is occurring in the world, and Attleboro is part of that as well. This is the Industrial Revolution, and it takes place between 1760 and 1840. It's a time when hand production methods give way to new methods of production, using machines, new chemicals, and iron production processes improved efficiency of water power, the increased use of steam power, and the development of machine tools. In 1811, Attleboro gets its first cotton mill. This is Mechanics Mills on what is now Mechanics Street. Other cotton mills would follow. Some of these were Farmer's Mill, Hebron Mill, and Dodge Mill. And that, of course, is Dodge Mill, still here. These factories required many workers, and the transportation methods of the time made commuting difficult. The answer to this problem was for the mills to build rows of houses near the factory where the workers would live. Small villages with their own churches, stores, post offices existed within the town of Attleboro. They had names such as Dodgeville, Hebronville, and Mechanicsville. The cotton mills created social change as well. When Attleboro was a farming town, opportunities for employment were limited, especially true for women. With the opening of the cotton mills came the advent of the mill girls. Young women could now work in the mills and gain a level of independence not experienced before. Child labor was also used in the cotton mills. At near the same time as the growth of cotton mills occurred in Attleboro, another industry began to develop. In 1780, a man known only as the Frenchman sometimes referred to as the foreigner, began making jewelry and brass door hinges in Attleboro Falls. In this small way, he began the great industry by which many thousands of people have since earned a living. The first jewelry manufacturing company in the town was began in 1807 in the Attleboro Falls area. Attleboro was the home of the first factory in the United States to produce metal buttons on a large scale. The jewelry industry would grow and develop in the Attleboro area for over 150 years and become Attleboro's claim to fame. Those in this industrial development period, three areas of Attleboro developed as center of business and population. They were the North Village, which was located on the Old Bay Road and was served by a railroad spur. The East Village, which was located on the Providence to Boston Rail Line. Uh, we are in the East Village and South Attleboro, which was the smallest of the three areas. In the mid-1800s, these areas were separated from each other by at least three miles of, parsley, of sparsely peopled land. I don't know if you can see that map that well, unfortunately, but it shows the three areas of Attleboro, a lot of space in between. You had three separate villages, again, maybe up to three miles of pretty much woods and maybe a few farms in between. And this is a period when you travel by horse or by foot. And so uh, there wasn't that one central area that, that was the city of Attleboro uh, at the time. Okay, because of the separation, each area became largely independent with its own schools, libraries, and fire departments. And after 159 years as the town of Attleboro, in 1855 came the first proposal that the North Village 
split from the rest of Attleboro and become a separate town. This proposal did not pass, but the idea did not die. In 1884, a town meeting voted on the same issue. The separation was again voted down by a vote of 184 for and 225 against, that is for not separating. At a town meeting in 1886, it was voted to petition the state legislature to divide the town. But this required a popular vote of the people. On July 30th, 1887, a town meeting was held to vote yet again on division. Now the meeting hall for Attleboro was located in the North Village. So North Attleboro had the meeting hall. So you would think with this lack of transportation, uh, the people in the North Village would have the most say. They would mostly be the ones who showed up to vote. But before this vote, on September 18th, the town had been divided into the pre three precincts with a voting place in each. So now they could vote in their own separate area. This assured a large voter turnout. Boy, don't they wish this would happen today. <laughs> Out of a possible 1,630 voters, 1,307 voted. And by a narrow margin of 23 votes, the division passed. It's interesting to consider what could have happened to change that vote. It's also interesting that the majority of the voters in the North Village <coughs> voted against division, while the majority of voters in the East Village <laughs> voted for it. In 1887, there were some feelings of rivalry, jealousy, and Ill, Ill feelings between the North and East Villages. Some felt that the disbursement of public monies was not done fairly. After the division, some North Village people thought that they had been put out of the town by the efforts of a few East Village men. Some also thought that the name Attleboro should belong to the North Village, since it was the oldest center of the original town. So we would have been, what would we have been? East Attleboro, I guess. That's the Spur Railroad, by the way. Now this is the, that's a picture of the celebration uh, in 1896, uh, Attleboro was celebrating the bicentennial of the founding of Attleboro in 1696. Interestingly, North Attleboro declined to join the celebration. <laughs> so there were still bad feelings. What would have happened if a few more voters had decided to vote? Well, this precinct had not been set up and all the voters had to trek to North Attleboro to vote. These events could easily have changed the outcome. What would Attleboro look like today if the division had not taken place? Without the division, Attleboro would be one of the largest cities in the state. The lightly settled areas between the villages in 1887 would become fully developed as they are today and improved transportation options would have eliminated the feeling of isolation between the three villages. As to the actual split, the division of land, population, and assets were amazingly equal. Two towns of very similar composition were created. The town of Attleboro forged ahead, and its strong industrial base and its location on the Boston to Providence train line brought prosperity. The town experienced a major setback in 1898 with the Great Fire of Attleboro. That picture, the spot the photographer is standing, is right here. Right here, probably at the front of the museum. This is looking down Union Street toward Park Street. Union, during this fire, uh, well, let's just talk about it. On the night of May 17th, a quick moving fire destroyed the industrial heart of the town of Attleboro. 19 jewelry firms, several small businesses, residential properties, and even one of the firehouses burned down in two and a half hours. Thankfully, a strong community spirit and a strong economy brought about a quick recovery. 
As we begin to talk about the era when Attleboro began to consider becoming a city, let's take a look at what the town looked like. So these are some pictures from the eight, from 1814 era, when Attleboro would become a town. In the front of the museum, we have a display of household items from the 1814 era to see how people lived. Take a look on your way out. Plus a series of pictures of places in Attleboro as they were in 1814 and as they are today. But here are some of the, some of the things that were built around that era. There's Main Street. Park Street, I should say. Park Street's a bustling center of commerce. Like most of the streets, it has a dirt surface and it's shared by horses and wagons, streetcars, and some of the new horseless carriages. There they are. An interesting side story. Uh, Frank Mossberg, who was an industrialist in Attleboro and had a, a flourishing company, uh, built cars for himself. He built three different models, and he was very interested in building cars in Attleboro, setting up a factory to build cars, and he went looking for financial backers. And initially, he found some financial backers, but they thought it over, and they decided that cars were just a fad, that they weren't going to work, and they withdrew their support. Had they not, we might all be driving Mossbergs today. During this era, the original library was built. The high school on County Street was built. The armory was built. The Newell Shelter at Capron Park looks a little different, doesn't it? And notice the Newell Shelter is here. Behind it is a large pine forest completely blown away during the hurricane of 1938. Now this gentleman lived on the corner of Park Street and County Street. This is Dr. Bronson. His house sat right on the corner. And during this era, his house was moved. There it goes, down the street so that they could build the Bronson building that we still have now. From 1903 excuse me, to 1932 was the era of the trolley lines. From 1903 to 1907, the area was served by two lines. The G Whiz line <coughs> was a direct run from Attleboro to what is now North Attleboro along the tracks of the former railroad branch line, and it ran through largely agricultural land in a straight line at the impressive speed of 15 miles an hour. The second line was the Interstate Consolidated Line. Their tracks followed the streets out through Attleboro Falls, made many more stops, uh, and again ended up in what is now North Attleboro. In 1907, both lines were taken over by the Rhode Island Company and continued service until 1932. Attleboro was taking on the look and feel of a small city, and the idea of becoming a city was taking root. In 1908, a debate was held to discuss the pros and cons of becoming a city. Here's the arguments. On the con side, those who favored staying a town advanced these ideas. The town meeting form of government had withstood the test of time. Creation of a city government would create additional municipal offices and increase costs. The state legislature allowed towns a greater debt limit than they did cities. The town would have a better moral atmosphere. Those in favor of city government presented their own ideas. A town meeting form of government was not viable for 2,600 eligible voters. A city government would have less friction between the municipal departments and municipal government. A mayor would provide a strong centralized management of the municipal business. They thought that town meetings cannot give proper attention to the large number of financial proposals that must be considered. Town meetings did not follow two-thirds of the recommendations of the financial committee, 
and after careful consideration, a city council would make wiser financial decisions. What do you think? <laughs> as with the separation from North Attleboro, such a major change as the transition from a town to a city was thoroughly considered over several years. In 1910, town meeting created a committee to consider the feasibility of becoming a city. Other committees considered the change in following years. By 1913, the change to city government seemed an accepted idea and the debate turned to what form the city charter should take. A bill to make Attleboro a city was passed in the state legislature and was signed by the governor on June 17, 1914. But the bill required a vote of the people of Attleboro. This vote was held November 3, 1914. With a very large voter turnout, the vote was for approval and of the change to city government. The charter called for a mayor, five ward councilors, and one at-large councilor. Councilors were to serve without pay. No party designations were allowed on the city ballot. And the name of Attleboro was made official, B-O-R-O, and replaced the old name, B-O-R-O-U-G-H. The last report for the town of Attleboro was submitted on December 13, 1914. Harold E. Sweet and James H. Leadham, both prominent citizens of Attleboro, ran for the office of mayor. The election brought out almost every voter in the city. Harold Sweet won by a landslide, 2,326 to 804. Over 1,000 citizens attended the inauguration address given by the new mayor. In the next 100 years, our place, the city of Attleboro, would grow and change as all successful cities must. It would play its part in two major world wars and several smaller conflicts. It would grow into a major center of jewelry manufacturing with companies such as Swank, Balfour's, the Robbins Company, and a host of others, providing jobs for many Attleboro workers. Other industries would thrive here as well with companies such as Mossberg and Texas Instrument calling Attleboro home. Today, Attleboro continues to evolve and grow. Many Attleboro residents can remember much of the city's 100-year history firsthand, while others are more newly arrived in the city and may not know much of its history at all. Still, we are all part of the history of this place. It is the history that stretches back over 10,000 years of human habitation. What will our future be moving forward? Will South Attleboro become a separate town? Will North Attleboro become a city? Will North Attleboro and Attleboro someday combine into one community again? None of us knows what the future will bring to our place. May the next hundred years be kind to our beloved city, our place, Attleboro. <laughs>